morning, everyone. Very, very Whoa. excited to have the full audience here on the first day of Slush. You also survived to come to the conference center despite the winter snowy weather. So congrats and amazing to have you all here. And we're having a pretty, pretty exciting talk and the discussion coming up during the next 27 minutes. So as the hosts already mentioned, uh, found, founding a company is one of the hardest things that a person can do. And there are a million things on the table when you found a company. So the idea during this discussion is to actually dive very deep into it. Like, what should you prioritize? What should you maybe deprioritize? And what actually matters when you're building a scalable business model? And I'm super, super excited to have Krista Ovasko joining me here on stage, multi-time founder. But also, Krista has just uh, founded a new company together with the team this January. So here, here to actually providing the hands-on insights uh, about what he has been focusing now and what actually matters when you're building a company. So let's start from the very beginning. Everything starts from a spark on an idea. And with Taito AI especially, like what specific problem you set out to solve and how did you actually decide that that's the right opportunity to take? Yeah, thanks, Aino. And I'm even more excited to be here than you are. And, and uh, super, super great to have Slash Weather here, here. But we need to go back in time a bit. Uh, during my times at, at Smartly, we were scaling five years in a row 2xing the headcount, uh, growing to roughly 1,000 people. And it was super chaotic. It was super chaotic. But at that time, I remember the founder inside me, even 2017, 2018, scaling at the fastest, thinking that, oh boy, I would love to see the tools in HR and in people tech that we are building in, in marketing. Uh, marketing was fully automated. We knew exactly which campaigns are performing, which are not. Uh, how to improve the performance. Uh, and then in, in HR, there was just no, no tools available at, at that time. So even at that time, I felt that, okay, if I ever start a new company, we need to automate, automate that side. A bit later, I realized that companies normally invest in two things. One is advertising. For consumer companies, it's normally the biggest investment they do. And then it's people. And for many companies, that's then the biggest, biggest investment they do. So if you're able to help marketers to automate and improve your return ad spend, there is a huge value. But if you are able to help people to improve their performance, there is equally a huge, huge value. So that's, that's what I was thinking 2019, um, 18, 19, much before I, I started, started, started Taito. And then maybe the third thing, I realized when I left Smartly as a CEO that the next company I want to build needs to be a combination of, of three things. One, where I do have a competitive advantage. And I deeply, deeply cared about people topics at Smartly. And, and we put huge amount of effort, effort to, to helping people to perform better and us, us to execute better because we knew that that will transfer our business. So that's the first element. Then the second element, is what world truly, truly needs. And uh, we saw that all the other functions at, at Smartly were automated by tools, but people and HR function was not automated. But the, then the third, and I would say even most, most important to me, was that you want to build something that you truly care and has a deeper meaning to, to you as, as a founder. I'm, I'm not sure if I were ever super excited about online marketing, we managed to build a great company, but I realized when stepping down from Smartly that what I'm actually really excited is helping people, and especially young talent, to grow and get better at what they too do and reach their full potential. So then when, when thinking of where to build, I thought that combining those three elements, your competitive advantage, your passion, and what the world truly needs and where there is a pain, uh, we decided to focus on, on, on the people and HR, HR tech. So that's how we started, started the journey. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. Maybe as a follow-up or, or related to that is that 
of course, you are not doing this alone. You have already put together a founding team, started recruiting the first, first team member. So where did you actually found your co-founders and how did you agree to commit to do something as amazing as founding a company together? Yeah, and uh, finding the right market is important and right, right topic to solve. But I would say that maybe even more important is to right, find the right co-founders. And uh, kind of previous company, we had two co-founders. I think that's a bit too little. I think four or five co-founders often is a bit too much. I think, I think and let's see if we have proved this right, but the three co-founders is, is an optimal number. You have enough diversity and different, difference of thought. And, and if, you, if you end up arguing with, with two of you, there is a third who can be the, the voice of reason, so to say. But then what, what do you need from the founding team? Well, you need the founding team to ship an MVP. The founding team needs to be able to take the first product into the markets and get the first customers and get the funding, but most importantly, ship the product. We do B2B business software, so you need someone who understands, and we are in business of AI as everyone nowadays is, uh, but, but you need someone who understands tech, backend, and AI. Then you need someone who is brilliant with the product and design and crafting the tool that customers love. And then you need someone who can hustle everything else together from funding, from customers, from office, from getting Coke and, and uh, soda to, to the coders and everything else. That's the role of the business guy. So I would say an optimal team is either three technical, technical founders, product design and tech, or then one business person combined with the, with the skills that you need. So that's one part. That's kind of the skills, the, the technical skills, the capabilities you need. But then equally important is the fact that you can, you've gone through hell together. And you've not gone through hell once, but you've gone through hell twice, third time and fourth time. And you still know that the fifth time the hell, hell, hell is breaking loose, you'll continue with that team and you'll enjoy working with that team. So you want to, build, you want to bring co-founders that you can trust and you have the same motivations, and you've gone through hell, hell together. So all of, all of us work together at Smartly, scaling Smartly's products, markets. Uh, with Yuho, we opened, opened UK, and we opened, opened US together uh, before he became a, became a developer. With Miko, we built the Pinterest and all of our new products together and taken those into the market. So you want to, you want to find a company with people who you trust and who you worked, worked together before. That's amazing. You mentioned the magical wor word MVP, so minimal viable product. And very curious to know, like, how, like, you mentioned that you should gather yourself with a team who can actually pull off the first MVP. Uh, so, what do you think? Like, how long should the team take to actually build it before they can start testing it and iterating and talk to the customers? Yeah, and even, even before thinking how long it, it takes, I think you need to understand what the MVP, MVP is. So I'll answer your question in a yes. second, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit, bit more context. So then one, when, once we started to work on the idea with, 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 with Juha uh, and Mikko, Mikko, first we called, we called 50 customers. We knew the space, we knew roughly the problem, and we had our own experience from, from Smartly. But we wanted to call the customers and validate, that are, are the others thinking the same? So we called 50 customers, who, and, and we were blown away that everyone was struggling with the same problems. Everyone was struggling with their continuous feedback, with their 360, 360 surveys, annual reviews, performance management cycles. And they were struggling with, with, to the extent that they, they were telling that, please save us, save us from, from here. So we got a lot of validation within those 50 customers that we interviewed early, early this year. And then, based on those interviews, we started to spec, spec, spec the product. And we started to build prototypes of the product on, on, on uh, wireframes, on Figma, uh, looking in and showing those, those to, to the potential customers. Uh, but not building any functionality at that point. Um, and then, that took maybe, let's say, a month or three weeks, four weeks to interview the customers, get, get access, to build the prototypes, get a bit of feedback for those prototypes. And then we selected the minimal viable product. And it's really important that it's a minimal. So it's the minimum feature set in order to solve the, the deepest problem that the customers have. 
and, but then it needs to be viable. So it needs to solve the problem so well that the customers actually want to use it and it adds value, value to them. And in my mind, building the first MVP and shipping to customers should not take more than three months. Maximum three months. If you can do it faster, the better. But the, the truth is that the learning starts the day that the first user starts to use the product. So everything is hypothetical because you don't know actually how the users will use the product, but also the users don't actually know how the problem needs to be solved for them. So it's really a collaboration and co-creation. And faster you can ship, ship the prototype or the MVP, the better, because then you'll, you'll start to, that's where this learning starts. And after you ship the MVP, like how have you kept these like early adopters? You mentioned that yep. you interviewed a bunch of people. Like how have you get them like along the way when you have started yep. like iterating? And it's 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 super important to select the customers well and be very upfront with the customers and manage the expectations and tell that hey, this is an MVP. It's not going to work at this point. It's not going to solve all of your problems, but we will work harder than anyone you've ever worked with to, together with you and partner together with you to solve this problem. And uh, you, need to, you need to find such customers who are willing to, and such people inside the organizations who are willing to be partners and solving, solving the problem with you and building the product with you. Because otherwise, you don't know how to build the product, but otherwise also the customer will never have the product that they need in order to solve their problems. And I think this is the, the infant and the first science of a product market fit. If you are on to solving something, something important for the customers, a pain point that is truly their priority number one, and they are truly excited, excited, and they want to work with a new startup, with, 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 with the product that is MVP and not, not functioning, if they want to work with you, you know that you are on to something. But it's really important that you start small, you start with tests with the small teams, uh, you build from there based on the feedback and you manage the expectations from, with, with the customers and being upfront that, hey, we'll be partnering on this alpha. And it's an alpha, it's, it's, we call it alpha because the product is very not mature at this point. And some customers don't want, want to be there and that's totally fine. They want a mature product and they don't want to be part of innovating together with you and building. And that's totally fine. They are really important customers, but you should not bring them as a customers in the early stage because both of you will be very disappointed if you, if you bring them too, too early. Yeah, there is a lot of talk about product market fit and actually understanding if you're building after all these like first iteration rounds to understand if you're actually building something that the customers love and want to keep on using. So how do how would you define like product market fit and from the founder perspective like or your previous experience like when do you know if you have reached the product market fit? And I, I think there is two kinds of companies in the world. You have companies with product market fit, and you have companies without product market fit. And if you're a company without product market fit, you are asking the question, how do I know that I have a product market fit? If you're a company with product market fit, you don't have time to ask that question. No one who has a product market fit wonders whether they, whether they have product market fit or not. And I'll tell you a bit more about it uh, in, in a second. But also, if you're a pre-product market fit, you have one sole purpose and focus within your company, and that is to find the product market fit, because everything else is secondary. And then if you have product market fit, your only focus is to scale the product, hire the people, get the servers up and running, keep the product alive, because you'll be ripped, the product will be ripped out from you and the customers are coming in from doors and windows, and you don't have time to answer the telephone, well, the emails nowadays, or LinkedIn nowadays, because everyone wants, wants the product. So that's the difference between product market fit and not, not having, a, having a product market fit. Uh, you are solving such an important problem from the customers that they, that they are coming to you to, to, to get the product out from you. Uh, and then there is different stages of product market fit. So your goal is to get to that extreme stage, but then there is step-by-step -step approaches and how you know that are you onto something. I think the first thing was that are, are actually customers interested to innovate with you, bear the, 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 the buggy and early stage product and, that's a, and answering your, your emails, and that's a great sign that you are maybe onto something. And then when the retention is really good, so in, in our case, uh, we, we look at continuous feedback and when we start to know this that there is more and more feedback every every week 
and there is more and more teams implementing uh, the product every week, then we know that we will be onto, onto something. And there is even, even uh, que questions that you can ask, like, okay, from your customers, that could you live without this product? And to some, some metrics, if half of your customers tells that they could not live without your product, then you would have a product market fit. But I think ultimately, when customers are coming to you and ripping the product out of you, and, and you, you just hire as fast as you, you can, and you, you, you onboard the customers as fast as you can, and you don't have time to onboard them fast enough, and they grow, they grow, and they, uh, they grow within your tool, they bring more teams, that's when, when, when you have, have a product market. And that's something that we achieved with Smartly, but obviously takes, takes time on average, two years to, to find product market fit. And we are working towards that and hoping that within next year, we'll, we'll actually have, have a product market fit. But it's a lot of work building the product, working with customers and solving the trickiest problems to, to get there. Amazing. Let's first talk about, or next talk about like actually taking your product out there and like launching the product. And I think like this is a very like, uh, topical uh, topic at the moment because you're actually living a very exciting time at Taito. Uh, so walk us through about like how did you approach your product launch? What is about to happen soon? How did you define the strategy, the timing for the product launch, the code market strategy? Ab absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it's almost a circle, circle closing because we met, met, met with our, my, my co-founder, Juho, we started to talk about the idea last year at Slash, and also our investor I met, met, met at Slash last year. But, but before getting back to that, uh, the circle closing, closing uh, first, you try to get access to, to any of the customers. So the first sales is founder-led sales. You, you, call, you, you call your friends, you, you, you bombard people in emails with, with your, your uh, with getting, getting half an hour to interview them on LinkedIn and whatnot. That's what we did uh, first half of, of this year. And we, we interviewed probably, probably 100, 100 customers. And some of them, we then knew that it will be the beta and alpha customers. So we started to work with them more. And then we went to, we went to alpha, uh, alpha this, er, uh, during the summer, and then into the beta from, from September. And beta is a, is a, is a paid, paid beta, and we know that now the product starts to add, add value and starts to be mature enough and aiming then to launch, launch in general availability when the product is ready, but, but the goal is, is early next year within the Q, Q1. And uh, it's important to do things in the right time. So first, you need to build the product, and you need to know that it's onto, you're onto something, and you need to know that, that it's actually adding, adding value. And in September, we started to then look at how we can scale the go-to-market. And uh, LinkedIn, in my opinion, is the best place at the moment. And you can, you can automate it really well. It starts from the fact that you, you de define your ideal customer profile, and then you start to do thought leadership around the continuous feedback and how to improve performance management and how to transfer the, transform the, the, the processes. And then you start to send messages to people on, on LinkedIn, and then you automate a lot of that LinkedIn messages. And then you ask, obviously, introductions from your investors, and you ask introductions from your alpha customers and, and whatnot, so you do all of that. And then, then coming to Slush, where we are launching, launching this year uh, the product, it's been actually surprisingly thoughtful and intense process the past, past two weeks, uh, past actually four weeks. But we are, we are having a side event, uh, inviting 200 potential customers. It will happen at the, at the, uh, at the lunchtime today. We have a startup booth. Uh, we are launching our PR as we speak. So we've been drafting a, our website as a whole. We are, we are drafting our messaging, uh, messaging to, to, to PR. And then we are, we've been on the background building the sales machine and uh, making sure that people join our wait list, which where we are driving, driving the interested, peop, interested companies and customers. And then we are picking up at the right time, the right customers from the wait list. Uh, we have hundreds of customers in the wait list. So that even before we've, we've launched and now we're aiming to double or triple at least the amount during, during the SLUS. And then we will step by step picking, picking the right customers at the right time. 
for building the product with us, and then ultimately when we go to GA, open, open to, to GA. But closing the circle is, is pretty nice, and we are using, using this opportunity as well. Uh, so a year ago, we, we met with my co-founder, Juho Atlas, decided that let's start to build something early next year, but also we met our, our investor, and uh, we are super excited to announce uh, the investment today, together with Axel and Illusion to, to, to Taito. And it's, it's super, super exciting to be building a company with Sonali, with Ilka and Miki, uh, with Nilo from Walt, and uh, with, with Robert, from, uh, Robert from Zalando, and transforming, transforming all of that. And how to put that into, into the context today is that obviously as a startup, you want to get all the visibility to you uh, in order to get, get more customers on your wait list. So that's why we're announcing, announcing the funding, funding today. I'm super excited, excited to announce it and have these people joining the journey, journey with us. And uh, interesting that I met with Sonali for the first time, first time here at SLAS last year. They missed out from, from Smartly and she's been keeping, uh, keeping, keeping in touch ever since. And after Robio and Supercell, it's, it's the, the third investment they ever do in, in Finland. So I'm pretty excited. That's very, very exciting and amazing news. Maybe related to that, though, since we're now talking about like raising funding and investors. So like, what do you actually look for when you start like fundraising? And people always talk about it's not only about like raising capital, but you're actually building a connection with the investor. So what yep. did you took into account when you started the initial discussion about like fundraising with several investors and like what characteristics or, or connections you, yeah. you wanted to look for. And uh, I approach investors in a very similar way than I propose, pro, uh, I, I propose almost <laughs> to the founding team. But as I, as, as I think about the founding team, you get married with your investors with no opportunity to have a divorce if the investor is not doing an exit. And if everything goes well, it's a 10-year 10 10 year journey. So you better pick your investors well in a very similar way than you pick your founders. They need to trust in the vision that you have. You need to know them well, and you know, need to trust them, and you need to enjoy the hell together with them because you'll, you'll be going through tough times with the investors. So I think that's, that's, that's really important. And then on top of that, if the investor can help you, to build the company, challenge you as a founder, because every founder and CEO needs to be challenged, and you are inside your bubble and inside your storm. Every now and then, the investor needs to, to get you out from the storm and look that, hey, there, there is actually sun there, and you might want to go that direction. And that is important. Every founder needs, needs someone to help and mentor. So that's, that's super important. Uh, then investors as well can very well open doors to early customers. Our investors have, have introduced us to tons of customers. So some of them are beta alpha customers, and that, that is super important. And they are able to help you with hires, the key hires, and, and challenge also who you think that would be needed and so forth. So it's really, it's really a building a company together with your investors, and that kind of investors you, you want. And you want to make sure that they trust you, you have the same views of building the company, and then when well, hell breaks loose, you still enjoy, they, they are still there to support you, and they are still there, there to, to, to guide you uh, through and not making your life miserable, which unfortunately often, often happens. Very, very insightful. We started running out of time, but we still have a couple more minutes. So my closing question for you is that, of course, as a multi-time founder, you have experienced the found, full founder journey, so to say, already already uh, sometimes, but now you're also like super excited about the new company. So I think like there are many early stage founders or aspiring founders in the audience. So like what are like to summarize the whole like discussion, like what are, I don't know, two to three most important things that one should focus on when they start building a company? Yeah. And, and I think either you mentioned there is tons of things and there is thousands of things and there is millions of things that you need to, to, to get done as a, as, a, as, a, as a founder, an early stage founder. But actually, there is very few things that matters and moves the needle. And you rather get the 9,997 things wrong and get the three things right. And I think those three things is to work the right market, 
where there is disruption and where there is growth and there is potential and there is pain. So selecting the market well. Then it is to select your co-founders really well. Select the founders that can build the MVP, can ship, and you can go through hell, hell together many times. And then it is to build your product. You need to build the product that customers and your users love, and you need to have all the focus building the product. And by that, you'll be focusing, building the right product to have first MVP and then product market fit. But actually, that's the only thing that matters. But with the wrong market and wrong founding team, you'll be never able to, to find it. And then when, when you think about the right product, right market, right industry, think about the three things, the intersection of your competitive advantage, what you truly love, and uh, what world world needs. And all of you, you'll, you'll be building such an amazing companies. And I, I hope that you'll build companies much more successful than Smartly ever was, Taito will ever do, and I trust you, you will. And there is only three things that you need to do. Build the product that, that customers love, and there you go. It sounds easy. That's amazing. I think like, that's a perfect final, final and ending note for this amazing discussion. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Christo. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.